Hello, everyone. You are listening to the At Percussion podcast. My name is Ksenia Komljenovic, and with me are my co-hosts, Carly Vigna and Caleb Pickering. What you're about to hear is the second part of episode 311 with the amazing Wave Quartet. In the first part, we had all four members join us, so Bogdan, Christoph, Emiko, and Nico. In this part, however, Emiko had to sadly leave because she wasn't feeling well, so you'll get to hear Bogdan, Christoph, and Nico answer our social media questions. I hope you enjoy. Well, that's amazing. Um, we have so many social media questions for you. We usually try to do this a little bit more quickly so that we don't keep you here all night uh, freezing. So Caleb is going to start them off. Yeah. Um, Jesse Guo from Canada had a pretty simple question. How many gigs do you play per year? <laughs> is this before or after or during Corona? <laughs> oh, probably before. <laughs> It's a game. So before was was a cool time, of course. Now we are down to lucky if we manage to play anything because you know you you have the concert. We had we had some concerts now rescheduled three or four times, and then a few days before they get cancelled again. So it's the fun of the century. But um, before, in the good times, we did have our few concerts per month in the peak season, and so depends, of course. Uh, there is no fixed number, but we did play quite some before Corona. Now we shall see how it goes after. <laughs> it's hard to plan anything right now. Um, we have another question. The next one is from Thomas Waller, who is from Sydney. And Thomas writes, what is the process individually and collectively to prepare for a performance? It's a big question. I mean, the, the pre I think you should be prepared if you come into the quartet rehearsal. <laughs> uh, and from there on, we rehearse and try to, we try to speak mostly about musical details. And, and of course, that's what your preparation should enable you when you come to the rehearsal. I'm going to cut this out and leave it on loop in front of my office for my students to hear. This is how you show up in a rehearsal. You come prepared. <laughs> That's how that stuff goes. <laughs> you don't come to sight read. Um, anyway, um, our next question was from Dmitry Konovalchuk from Kiev, who said, I'm a huge fan of yours. How often do you rehearse? And do you have a leader in rehearsals? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've already cleared out that Emiko is the boss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we do not have a leader. So um, there was a time in the beginning, of course, when I was maybe taking more often over and saying that's the way to go or whatever. But meanwhile, as we said before, we are four different characters with four different ways of feeling and playing. And, and if I would say, or he would say, we have to play this like that and the other one doesn't feel it like that, that would be a pretty sad thing for the quartet. So, so the rehearsal it's more of a discussion and like christoph said before it's a discussion on on musical terms so what can we do in order to become to become good enough for for that piece musically seen we should not come to talk about it's not together a technical problem or whatever or wrong choice of mallet oh no 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 so we are talking simply about music and how can you make that piece get as close as possible to the point where even, even we enjoy it after 10 hours of rehearsing. <laughs> and 10 hours? Is that a regular rehearsal? No. no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, I think also in, in the beginning, uh, like when we really started the quartet, we we needed quite some time to yes. to to find this this way of playing together and and to get a common ground. Mm. Um, it also, of course, it's it's a it's different if you have new pieces mm. uh, or if you like if you develop some some new repertoire or if you just like warm up some some repertoire that you already played. Uh, a few times in, in a concert. So I think it's hard to say like mm. this amount of hours or mm. this amount of, of days, but because we, 
we do play um, regularly uh, together. We never have like these huge periods where we don't rehearse together. And I think that's also mm, quite quite important for us that we don't lose ourselves too much. Also clearly said, talking about how much we rehearse, after 13 years, of course we have Nico, but, but he's a part of it already. But believe me, I don't, I don't need to talk to Christopher, to Emiko about this phrase has to be together or whatever. So we feel each other already so good that that is not an issue. So by putting that out, you know, if you, if you have a student ensemble that comes together the first time, you will have all the different characters, most of them still with not so much experience and each one of them will try to play his part as good as he can without really but we really know each other. It's enough that Christoph has a different way of breathing and I know exactly what he's going to do. And with Emiko is even better because me and Emiko are like really the same character of playing. We love the same part of the marimba and the same way of pushing it. And we, we don't talk, it's just, it just goes. <laughs> yeah. Telepathy, it just works. Yeah. Going off of Dimitri's question, uh, Cosmin, Dimitru from Bucharest uh, asked, what is your work ethic and how do you schedule your rehearsals? I message. Um... <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> and work ethic sometimes more, sometimes less. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's pretty simple actually. It's, I mean, all of us have a job another job also, except of the quartet. So luckily we two teach in the same university, but he has also quite some solo concerts to play on top of that. Um, Nico is playing now in the Bruckner Orchestra for, for with a two years contract. Emiko is teaching in the University of Vienna and in a music school. So of course we have our schedules. That's why I message <laughs> and we know exactly the next project comes. Uh, we know about how much we need in order to do what kind of repertoire and what are we are going to do. And depending on that, we adapt. And honestly said now also, which is very sweet over the last nearly two years, um, our schedule, our rehearsal schedule has been 100% uh, decided by Aimi, who's Emiko's daughter. She has a two years old daughter. So of course we have to adapt to her, which is very sweet. So we are always adapting to, to that. <laughs> My brain was processing that for a second. I was like, oh, that's nice. She manages your calendar. And then I was like, oh, no, she's two. <laughs> <laughs> that's what was running through my mind just now. <laughs> well, our, our, next, our next question, we have another one from our friend Dimitri Konovalchuk. And he asks, do you sometimes get bored of performing one piece over and over again? No. 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 <laughs> no, it's... it's, it's um, this is something that, that, that one of the main things that I teach in Linz, which all of us are taking very serious, it's if you come to a point that a piece gets boring, it means that you are making a serious mistake in your approach, in your musical approach. That means you have learned that piece somehow by heart in any term, and you keep just rattling it down again and again and again, and that will get boring, yes. But um, we never play a piece the same way, never. We are always adapting and there's, there are so many things changing and, and, and uh, it's, it's so much, so much that comes new on every concert. So we are playing now Carmen since, since the recording and it's every time a challenge because it's again totally different and new things that we discover and new things that we change and and it's no no it, it should never get boring then there is something wrong in the way you approach in general music hmm. we have another one from bucharest uh alexandra pliandra asks do you have any habits or rituals before a concert and how many hours do you practice each day 16. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nico, do you have any habits? I mean, concerts? 
eat a lot, drink <laughs> a lot. <laughs> no, I think we we always try to to have some fun, to have a good time, you know, to focus, but just to to be happy and to yeah to get in the happy mood and then <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah the happy, the happy mood no no we are you know we are always together so yeah so that's the thing we always try to to be relaxed Actually, then it works. actually, uh, one thing that me and Nico have as a small, and I don't know, I don't know if you can call it uh, habit, yeah. it's telling together, making a nice list at every rehearsal and at every concert, just before making a list for him, for Christoph, telling him how many things he forgot, how many things he got again wrong, um, in general, talking about the organization, I'm and, how many, I'm and how many times he got too late, way too late at the rehearsal. <laughs> Meanwhile, so for for example, today we said we come here so that we're in time for six o'clock. And I said, I said to, uh, we said we drive together from the city here. And I, I told Nico, uh, Christoph will pick me up, and then we pick him at half at, at ten past five. And Nico told me, no, tell him you pick me up at quarter to five. Then you're going to be here at ten past five. <laughs> Guys, you have to decide. Either you tell this kind of stories or you say we are constantly in a happy mood. We're in a happy mood. We sound all together like an old uh, marriage. <laughs> no, but um, sometimes there is not even, even time to, to, to get a to get a ritual, I think. I mean, it, it happens that, you you know, it takes some time to build up our instruments and it happens that we just try to, to rehearse, to get to know the hall and mm. we get off stage and then mm. half an hour later, yeah, we start the concert. Uh, and talking about how many hours, especially if it's just before the concert, there are many concert halls, especially major concert halls. You're lucky if they give you the one hour or something, so, so. You won't get yeah, generally. yeah you and in general, of course, adapting to our to our to our schedules and so on. And I mean, of course, there are many times, many concerts where we would like to have the two extra more hours, but uh, when he is just coming from a tour somewhere in Luxembourg and I just had to teach him that they ate students, um, there are not many hours left where you can rehearse. So you just go as much as you can into the night until one of us falls asleep. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, a lot of the questions that we got were sort of the questions that we initially had for you because we had so many people write in, but it felt like most of the people wanted to ask you these questions that are almost like if if they could have a camera just walk, you know, follow you around for one day and see exactly what you have for breakfast and how much water you put, you know, intake and all of these things, like what exactly is your warm up uh, procedure so that they could figure it out and then try to copy it and then maybe they would you know also be as good as you that that seemed to me like the gist of a lot of questions just like well tell me is is the secret that you eat a banana before a performance is that it <laughs> you know what what is it um but it seems like you all just take it as it comes and try to do your best to be organized well except for Christoph obviously but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, this is this is what life will teach you in the end that you can try to have as many habits as you want, or as many you can try to plan as many practice hours as you want, and we can keep on doing this about whatever you try to plan. But life will teach you in the end that you just have to take it the way it comes, and it will come always different, like always, always. And and it's it's I think one of the one of the most one of the toughest things we had in a concert was we played in Spain in Ronda, a beautiful historical place. Uh, it's actually bull, bull it's, it's a bullfighting ring, but but we uh, like a serious old like old one. We, it's not it's like serious serious history. What the organizer didn't realize is that marimbas do react pretty allergic to sun. And um, especially when you are in a bullfighting ring, which are, which are simply stone walls going up without a roof, and with the Andalusian sun, you would have on the stage something like 50 degrees. 
Um, <laughs> so then uh, we had to cancel. The, on top, those were not our instruments. The instruments were delivered. So we didn't know what we play on. Uh, we couldn't build anything up before because, I mean, you couldn't get out on that uh, on that stage for less than two seconds without melting. Um, so we just put all the instruments in into the basement of the of the ring, so under where it was totally humid and ugh, and we left them there. The concert was planned for ten o'clock in the evening, in the night, ten o'clock, so that the sun goes down. Sadly, the, Spain, the sun in Andalusia goes down around 9.30 or 9.45. And we couldn't build up the instruments. So we, we, we don't even talk about warming up what you were saying before or whatever rituals or whatever. We didn't know the acoustic. It was impossible. We didn't know the instruments. We didn't know anything. So about 15 minutes before the concert, really, no joke, 15 minutes before the concert, we started really like small rats taking pieces out of the, of, the, of, the, of the basement and bringing them on the stage with the public already there waiting. Um, we build up the instruments, then we come with the bars like this as the last thing, put them on the stage, and we wanted to start playing. And my first thought was like, hmm, how would this sound now? <laughs> on top, realizing that I played an Adams, Christoph played an Adams, Vladi played an Adams, and Emiko played a Yamaha. <laughs> So <laughs> that was really, really tough. Then we started playing, and on top of that, because of because of carrying the stuff, where we couldn't say anymore, Emiko, you are not as strong. Don't do that. You know, we had to really move it, all of us. So end of the story was that after the first piece, Emiko's back cracked, like and the muscles, the right. muscles, and her head stopped to the right, and she couldn't move it anymore. It was simply frozen to the right. The problem is Emiko plays always on my right side. So she would just simply face Vladi the whole time, but no one else. <laughs> so after the first piece, I said, okay, we do something which we never did on top of new instruments, new acoustic, and we switch the positions in the quartet so that Emiko can sit like that and watch at least two of us like that. <laughs> oh my God. So talking about practice, this time predictable rituals whatever yeah sure <laughs> and actually our funny funny thing was our wardrobe was in the in the place that is usually reserved reserved <laughs> like as a uh, emergency operation uh, unit in case the bullfighter gets gets stabbed but yes <laughs> this is where our wardrobe was <laughs> <laughs> so it was a great oh, experience. The, we were changing on the emergency room of the, of the, if the guy gets killed or stabbed or whatever. But in the end, it was a great. The concert was. It fantastic. was a great experience. It was somehow, fantastic. But, I mean, yeah. history pure and and quite a quite an amazing amount of people that fit in there, you know. And and the marimbas were in the middle of the of the fighting ring, you know. So it was quite an experience. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. Whose idea was that concert, that space? My, my management. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. a, that was a festival, actually. I think yes, it was. It was the, the, the festival. It's actually under the under the um, after the guidance of somebody of Daniel Barnboim. So so it was the Barnboim Foundation organizing the entire festival. Yeah. So. Wow. But did not. Quite a, I'm sure they learned a lot about marimbas that that one time, and the next time they they have you in or have anyone in, it's, they it's learned great. Don't mess around with marimbas; <laughs> they are a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Wow, that's a that's a story. There you go. Well, that that sounded almost like a nightmare scenario, just like things you'd want to wake up from. But you nailed it, of course. We're not surprised. The whole it's more a, a horror scenario where you could really smell the stress on all four of us. But then we started doing what we are best on. We started laughing and we started having fun and then it went. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, well, the final question uh, from social media uh, comes from uh, Linus uh, Elias Gustafsson from Sweden, who said, will you and when will you be releasing the arrangement of Carmen? I mean, did you release anything ever? I think there is no 
mm -hmm. no score available from any piece. So yes, and yeah. some people are asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's impossible. We get the questions pretty often, actually. Yes, yes. Yeah. But it has two reasons. Reason number one, most of our pieces, for example, all our Piazzolla arrangements, you need to have the rights for that. It's a very common thing in the, again, in the percussion, or especially the people would take some small tango and arrange it on a marimba. It's okay, I suppose, if you do it inside the school or maybe percussion society, we are kind of on the limit. But as far as you go with it outside on the stage, the rules will change. And then you may wake up next day in the morning with a huge bill. And, you know, that is not funny. So the problem is we bought the rights for ourselves, but we don't have the rights to publish it. Yes. And th there's a big difference in, yeah. in that. So for, for some of the pieces, you don't even you don't even have the chance to get the right to, to yeah. publish it. And with Carmen, it's uh, like I said before, it's actually not the arrangement of BC's version, but uh, I mean, BC's original piece, but uh, of Rodion Chedrin's version. And, and he wrote this in the, in the 60s. I think he, he's still living in, in Munich, in fact. So we contacted him and, and his publisher, and he allowed that we, that we uh, record and play it in concert, but it's a different thing to, to publish it. And also, there is a second reason that many, 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 or most of our scores are simply not. So if you, if you see the score and you listen to us playing that piece, let's say after a few months, you will have difficulties following the score because so many things change. And suddenly we have people like players like him that likes a lot to improvise or slightly change the part or something. So it will change completely. Vladio was the same. And, and um, after a while you publish something out and then it's totally different to what you play. And then you get the silly questions and it's better not to do that. Um, well, we've kept you here for almost two hours and we're very grateful for your time. So before we wrap up, we just want to hear what are some of your future projects? What are you looking forward to as soon as, I guess, everything gets out of lockdown and you, everyone can be back on stage more, but what are some things you're looking forward to? Well, basically our, our next next concerts and and hopefully they will happen this time <laughs> and also at some point a cd recording of, of what of what can we get us uh, a little <laughs> <laughs> just a half just a half of it so the, the the second half no the first half it's back to the roots let's say like this to one of our first very beloved ideas there is a concerto by Astor Piazzolla called Aconcagua it's a concerto for bandoneon, piano, string orchestra, and timpani, where we got the permission to, to arrange it. It was a tough one, but we got it. We have premiered it uh, with Tom Künstler Orchestra from Vienna and the Jutta Casado, and uh, it is an incredible concerto. And we have simply, we, we took out the solo bandoneon, solo, piano, the harp player, the three of them, we took them on the four marimbas and the orchestra stays the way it was. And it's a killer. It's a fantastic piece. So this is the first part of it. And when is that to be expected? Sort of, at least. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we don't have a release date yet, actually. So probably in the next year. Okay, well, that's that is something for all of us to look forward to, as always. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. This is very exclusive, everybody. At Percussion, you heard it on here first, right? <laughs> um, well, thank you so, so, so much for being our guests. It really is such a pleasure. Thank oh, you for pleasure. having us. Thank you. There is there is one, one project for the... That's, that's, that is my Mount Everest, let's put it like that. It's something that musically seen, I, I was my entire life just like, will I ever? And um, that is something that was supposed already to happen, got cancelled thanks to Corona. 
Um, and it's now getting reorganized, rescheduled. Let's see how it comes. Yeah, yeah so like in two, two years ago. Yeah, two just, years. just before Corona, the year before Corona, I think, me and Christoph got, I cannot even say the honor, it was, it was just mind blowing. We could play with Academy of Ancient Music from London, talking about Baroque and talking about period instruments. So if you talk about Everest, yeah, that is the place. And we got invited and we played for with them two harpsichord concertos. So this, the harpsichord got practically out and me and him got into the orchestra and they played it, it is for, let's say like this, the first time for me to, to feel like a, like a small kid on the stage and it was like, you know, and, and, and this is what we are trying to do again. And I think this is from, from a musically point of view, you work a life, a lifelong for something like this to, to be able to play with such musicians, you know, and, and this is something for me where I can say, okay, I play this project and I can stop. <laughs> Well, so many wonderful things that you have in store and so deservedly. Um, thank you again so, so much for being our guest. We know that you're very, very busy and we appreciate your time and all your sharing and jokes. Christoph, I'm really sorry that I called you disorganized. I don't think so. You've always been really nice when I ask you anything. You've always responded very quickly to email. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can accept the apology. <laughs> I have to think about, but I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, Again, thanks thank for having us. Yes, yes. It's absolutely our pleasure. I am very grateful for my wonderful co-hosts here, Caleb and Carly. Thanks for for being here and holding my hand so I don't freak out too much. Uh, ben and Casey, we missed you, um, and to our <laughs> listeners. Great. Sorry. Greetings to both of them. Yes, absolutely. We will we will say hi uh, from you. Absolutely. And thanks to all our listeners who chimed in and asked questions. Um, this was a again. Thank you so much. It's a very special opportunity for the percussion community to hear about all of this. Because I feel like I could find interviews and interviews about you from fancy TV stations and so on. But we got to poke around a little bit about the percussion stuff. Um, so thank you so much for doing this for, for us as an audience. We have to thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. This has been a long episode, but so very worth it. Uh, we will see you on 312 and uh, enjoy the end of the year. Bye, everyone. <laughs>